Well, good evening. Welcome to Copernic Observatory and our FNL Friday night live stream. Uh, tonight's program is going to be a program on geocaching, but we'll get started uh, first. Uh, let's see, we'll start with, uh, let's go to uh, my program here, and we're going to just move you over. For those that are fairly new to Copernic, uh, this is our website. There's always a, a lot of good information on that, including uh, tonight's program. Um, and, and we've been getting a lot of questions about, you know, is Copernic open for viewing? And, and fortunately right now, just due to the situation, we really feel that it's not sort of scientifically appropriate, if you will, to, uh, uh, you know, to expose large, large number of people to each other. So we're gonna continue to remain closed, but we will continue to offer these live stream programs uh, and as many live stream, uh, you know, vir virtual uh, opportunities to, to engage. So uh, we'll look forward to uh, hopefully being able to, to have you uh, uh, join us soon. The other thing I was going to point out is that uh, Copernic, uh, one of the main things we do during the summer is our summer camp programs. And we are running them, but they are actually done uh, in a live stream, uh, in a, I'm sorry, in a virtual uh, setting. So we actually, uh, starting next week, uh, next Monday, we actually doing a, camp called Secrets of Code for uh, uh, students uh, just getting into grades three and four. Um, the following week is actually going to be a new camp for us uh, called Entering a Virtual Universe, and this is uh, dealing with VR, and uh, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, Jeremy is doing a fantastic job of putting this together. He's done some of the 360-degree uh, the uh, sh um, live streams that, uh, you've, that we posted up on our YouTube channel, so you uh, so definitely want to check that out, and if you've got um, a middle schooler that's sort of into the into VR. Definitely have them check uh, check this out. This would be a great camp for them. Is there an age limit? Uh, yeah, there's, unfortunately there is an age limit. So uh, <laughs> otherwise I'd be signing up. Um, uh, then the week after that, what's in your backyard? Become a nature scientist for students uh, entering fourth and fifth grade. And then one that I'm uh, particularly interested in is uh, in the fifth for fifth and sixth grade students called Welcome Aboard the International Space Station. And this is going to be an opportunity for students to learn. Uh, what it takes to become an astronaut, what kind of training they go through uh, as an astronaut, and then once they're finally on board uh, the International Space Station or a deep space mission, what sort of activities, you know, experiments, uh, work that they do uh, while on, on the station. And what's particularly unique about this, this camp is we've had an opportunity to, uh, we worked it out with NASA so that we will actually have our students in this camp are able to talk to an astronaut on the International Space Station as they're flying by. Uh, the ISS actually has a ham radio station uh, on board that the astronauts use to talk to students, and we have a ham radio station here at Copernic, and so we will get our students uh, connected through that ham radio to talk directly to uh, Chris Cassidy, the astronaut uh, assigned to our to our contact. So. Uh, uh, It'd be a great opportunity for uh, a fifth or sixth grader uh, when, you know, come, come this fall when people ask, well, what did you do this, this summer? You can say, well, I talked to an astronaut on the ISS. So anyway, something worth, uh, worth checking out. And uh, next week, our, our Friday night program will be uh, Tish Brizzy, one of our educators here, and she's going to be talking about the uh, launch of the next Mars rover called Perseverance that's supposed to be launching either on July 30th or within the first two weeks of uh, August. So we'll get a sort of a preview of what that's going to be like. So I think what we're going to do now is we are going to uh, move right into our program. So uh, let me go and figure out where that is. Oh, yeah. I just got to reduce this and reduce this. And here we are. So um, again, my name is Drew Desk. I'm the director here. But um, the real director in the building is my wife, uh, Leanne Lesperance, uh, and my geocaching partner. And so we are going to offer these two, uh, th this program together. Uh, this is something we've, we've uh, done for a little while and uh, really enjoy it and uh, hope you will as well. So uh, we'll just get moving. So that is why we, neither of us has a mask on because we're married to each other right. and, we, and we live together. So we're in close proximity here. And, and there's nobody else yeah, in the yeah. building, so so it's it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. All right. So, geocaching, modern uh, treasure hunting. So tonight's outline is we're going to talk about 
what is geocaching, who does it, why, how do you geocache, and of course, like everything else in the world, what are the rules and who enforces them? So what's a geocaching? It's, it's uh, again, we call it a, mo a modern uh, treasure hunt. Uh, I like to call it, uh, all right, well, go ahead. It's an outdoor oh, okay. recreational activity okay, right. uh, in which participants use a GPS receiver to hide and seek containers or things called caches at locations marked by coordinates all over the world. Uh, another name for it is, oh, oh I'm sorry, Fuck. okay. Uh, we also call it um, using multi-billion dollar satellite system to find Tupperware in the woods. And that's mostly what you're gonna find. <laughs> However, not, not all of it is like that way and, and, and we'll, be getting, we'll be getting into that. So, um, what is GPS? GPS is called a Global Positioning System, and there are uh, typically, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, we <laughs> obviously have not rehearsed this together. Right. So. She did the slides, and I'll get to it. Yeah. I'm so uh, the GPS is actually a U.S.-owned utility that provides positioning, navigation, and timing services. It uses multiple satellites that orbit 12,550 miles overhead and transmit their current position down to Earth via radio waves. By analyzing these signals, it's possible for this GPS, uh, for the, a GPS device to determine the latitude, longitude, and altitude of the user's locations. And again, the military has been using this for years, um, but we're gonna learn about uh, how uh, us uh, regular citizens get to use it. So, and for the GPS, there's usually 24 satellites. Um, here's a picture, a, a sort of mock-up of 24 satellites in orbit. And they are um, moving twice a day. They move around the Earth. Each, mm. of, each one of the satellites moves around in its orbit uh, two times during the day. And the GPS receiver can get signals from the satellites that are visible from the, whatever location the receiver's at. So in this picture, it's the little um, red lines and, and where they focus on the Earth is where the receiver theoretically is. Um, the satellite network, the way that they've got it configured, ensures that there's always at least four satellites that can see any location on the Earth. And that's, again, what this graphic shows, uh, is how many satellites are visible as the Earth is turning and as these satellites are orbiting. Um, so having at least the four of them is necessary to determine the latitude, the longitude, and the altitude of that current position on the Earth's surface. So um, th that whole system makes up this um, the GPS. Right. It's actually controlled by the U.S. Space Force, which is the kind of new name right. for something beyond the Air Force, but it's it's a U.S. government service that we're provided. That is what the GPS is. Right. Um, also, again, if you if you have any questions along the way, just type them into the chat box. We are able to see them here, and we'll be able to uh, uh, answer them as they uh, as as they present themselves. All right. So. Um, the different ways, the different uh, devices that we can use to uh, uh, look at GPSs. I know some of you have them in, the, in your cars, uh, but for our purposes, we need something we can walk around with. And so this is, these are actually three different uh, uh, versions of sort of hiking GPS uh, devices that, uh, or handheld uh, receivers that tell you where you are and you can even put in where you'd like to go and it'll point you in that direction. And, and that'll be important uh, as we're doing geocaching. Um, so again, the location is actually displayed on a, you know, on a map background. Uh, again, we use it in hiking, uh, backpacking, uh, canoeing, marine navigation, uh, hunting and fishing. Uh, search and rescue people uh, use it all the time. Uh, and of course, uh, many people have uh, GPS in their car or now they're on their smartphones. Um, and what's also nice about these, uh, these these hiking ones is they actually give you an opportunity to to, to sort of reverse track. You can uh, uh, 
when you get to where you're going, if you want to follow the same route back, you can just use that GPS and it'll, it'll point you the way. All right, how did geocaching get started? Uh, the GPS system was started by, the, again, the Department of Defense in 1973. Initially, it was only used by the military. And civilian access started in the 1980s, but, but during the 1990s, GPS quality was degraded by the U.S. government in a, in a program called Selective av Availability. And with that, you know, the best accuracy you could get was maybe within 150 feet. But on May 1st, uh, selective availability May was... May 1st, 2000. 2000, thank you. Yeah, 2000. That's, that's important, I guess. It's the 20-year anniversary, actually, almost, of geocaching. This All right. year, Th This year was, yes, okay. Uh, and uh, so they, they discontinued that, uh, that selective ability, availability by a law signed by President Clinton, which allowed GPS units, uh, owners, to, uh, to, you know, owned by civilians to be accurate within 6 to 20 feet. So really it was a factor of 10 improvement, so 10 times more um, accurate in terms of yeah. locating. So May 1st, 2000, so we, again, we just went through our, our 20th anniversary. That's, uh, again, that GPS signal was, uh, uh, the degradation was removed, and it really allowed you to uh, get much closer to where you, you, where you think you want to be, which is going to be important when you're geocaching. So the first geocache was actually placed uh, by a computer consultant named David Ulmer who wanted to test the accuracy of the GPS. So he buried, he buried a large plastic bucket containing a variety of items at a location in Beaver Creek, Oregon, and posted the coordinates on an internet GPS users group. He called the idea the Great American GPS Stash Hunt. The rules for the finder were simple. Take some stuff, leave some stuff. But within three days, it had been found twice. A few months uh, later, Jeremy Irish, a web developer in Seattle, developed it, uh, decided to start a hobby website for the activity, and geocaching.com was born. When the activity got too big for uh, Irish's home computer, the company Groundspeak Incorporated was founded to manage it. So geocaching is now in all 50 states and nearly every country in the world. Uh, geocaching.com is by far the number one website for geocaches. There are over 3 million caches worldwide. In fact, there are so many geocaches that if you stacked them all end to end, they could reach, of all places, the International Space Station. If you found 10 caches per day, it would take you 822 years to find all 3 million caches and you'd need to visit 191 out of 193 countries in the world. So you can see on this map, each of those green dots, if you will, is a geocache. Um, they're obviously not to scale, but they're in literally on every continent. And uh, we do have our first question, uh, Earl, hello Earl and Mary Alice, um, uh, asking, uh, is there a decent app for smartphones? Well, mm -hmm. yes. There I'm is. glad you asked that and your timing could not have been better. So actually, when Drew and I started doing this, we did use a GPS device. Yeah. In fact, the very first time we did it, we borrowed one from Copernic because Copernic had a GPS right. device, and then we already decided we liked it, so we bought one. Um, the two key features of the GPS that are useful for geocaching was displaying the location of the user and the location of a nearby item on a map background, and then getting the user to within 20 to 30 feet. Um, so I had a car that was, had, was able to put um, coordinates in. Mm -hmm. So initially, we would put our coordinates in the car, and the car's GPS would get us to sort of where we wanted to be. Um, and then we would use that handheld device for walking around in the woods. But now cell phones, uh, well, at the time we did not have a smartphone. Yeah. We had an antique kind of flip phone with no GPS capability. I think it was rotary dial, yeah. actually. Yes, yeah. so there were no apps on our phone at that time. But cell phones, once they started to have apps, uh, pretty early on had GPS apps. And those apps can be used for geocaching. Now, geocaching.com, which is in this picture here, is the most popular app that there is. The downside to 
using the app on your phone is that it uses data and you have to be within cell phone service coverage so depending on where you are and literally some of these geocaches are in pretty remote areas so the satellite is going to find you almost all the time but your cell phone tower is not going to necessarily find you so uh, we have learned though that you can put stuff on your phone even without data and it you know the maps will stay loaded on your mm -hmm. phone and you can get pretty Pretty close. Pretty close because yeah. when we were in Europe last summer on the cheap, we had no data and we just would use our cell phone when we had access to data at a um, internet Wi-Fi enabled right. area and we would sort of load up what we wanted to do and then we would make our way uh, with it without the data. So, so right. yes, cell phones and in fact, we don't even, um, don't even know that our, where our initial cell phone, uh, um, GPS device was. Yeah. Now, the cool thing about the GPS devices was that some of them started to be able to download, you could you could store your information, information about in them, it. Right. Yeah. In the very, very beginning, we would print stuff out from the computer, but we'll get into that a little bit more. All right, moving on. So, um, okay. so who are geocachers? Who does geocaching? Well, we do. Okay. Uh, I will go back here. People, yeah. people do. Um, there are seven million active geocachers, uh, supposedly, uh, who I guess then have We're registered, registered with right. various sites. Geocachers gather in groups, and so events they have. There's geocaching events. There's 35,000 events annually to share stories, ideas, exchange trackables. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, there are almost 2,000 geocaching organizations around the world. So that's people who go together, like I think of it as like a hiking club. We have the Triple City mm. Hiking Club. So people that don't want to hike by themselves get together and that's what those geocaching clubs are for also for people who geocache together. So it's really pretty much regular people, uh, families, very popular with families, popular with couples, singles. Um, there are, uh, as, as we'll see, there's accessibility instructions when you look up a geocache, so people can do it uh, with different levels of mobility. You can um, barely get out of your car you, and you know to everything in between. So right. um, there's other groups that do it, if you wanna hit those. Oh, okay. Well, I was gonna say, on this picture, you can tell you, you'll, uh, you'll look like everybody else that's out there because everyone's just looking at their phones as they're walking around. Yeah. So you won't look any different than anybody else. So there are you know, um, actual sort of formalized programs, both the Boy Scouts uh, or Scouts BSA and, uh, and Girl Scouts uh, now offer geocaching badges. And uh, so they're uh, you know, sort of learning about the process, but also some of the technology behind it. And so it's a great, uh, a great learning tool along with the fact that you just, you're getting outside. Yeah. So in fact, okay. why do we do it? Uh, why do people do it? So you get outside. Um, I know it made me think of Pokemon Go, which I never really did, but I guess one of the excuses for Pokemon Go also was to get outside. Um, right. You get moving. It gives you an excuse to walk or a destination to walk to. Mm. Um, it can also liven up what might be an otherwise dull activity. Like long distance driving. So for example, here we were on a highway road trip, long, long trip, stopped at a rest area, whipped out our uh, geocaching app and found out that there was a geocache at the rest area. In fact, it was a super fun one with a little outhouse at, at. attached to a tree um, so you can see the picture there so again it makes a long trip uh, and and boring rest stop areas uh, boring rest stop stops um, more interesting so it's actually it's amazing uh, you know as we've been taking various trips uh, as a family uh, it's rare to actually come into a rest stop and have it not have a geocache so uh, again it's a great opportunity to get out stretch your legs and uh, sometimes there's even more than one. Oh yeah 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 some of the bigger ones, yeah. This is uh, two sort of um, family photos. So on two different vacations. Uh, and you know, when you spend a long weekend, like a Thanksgiving or a Christmas holiday with family, you sometimes really need a reason to get outside and get some space from each other. 
and have a goal or something to do other than eat or cook or clean. So these are two different vacation photos. One was in Virginia, I think, and one was in Florida. And we were visiting family, and we ended up going to do a, do a geocache with, uh, with our family. So You'll, you'll notice in the lower right-hand corner, uh, there's, sometimes you have to go to some well, moderate, moderately extreme lengths to find these caches. Yeah. And, um, but we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that here in a bit. Um, again, here's some more uh, family kind of outings and, and turning trips into adventures for, for uh, you know, and as another reason to, uh, to do it. So just, right. just more pictures of things we found and people right. we've done it with. So. so how do you do it? Uh, you don't really need much to do it. No. You need some kind of GPS device. Now, as an aside, let me mention letterboxing. Letterboxing was actually started in 1854 mm. in England, and letterboxing is sort of treasure hunting using orienteering, and some art and puzzles are involved in, the, in, the, in letterboxing. So people would say, you know, take 50 steps east and take... 100 steps west or what um, for that sport. So um, you didn't need much for letterboxing either. But for and so for this, you do need some slightly higher technology. And again, in the beginning, we just borrowed a GPS device mm -hmm. from somebody. So you need some way of getting GPS coordinates. Um, I have to say, you could theoretically, with a compass, can you do... Uh, Latitude and longitude? No. Okay, you have to have a GPS yep. for latitude. Yeah, no, you you you'd need a map. You'd have to sort of map it out on a map, okay, and then, and then try right. to. So you really can't you really can't do it without some kind of GPS device. Right. And again, most people nowadays use their phone and not the dedicated GPS devices. Right. And then the other thing you really should have is a pen or a pencil. Other than that, that's pretty much all that you need. And then you're going to... Oh, and, and sensible shoes. Oh, sensible shoes. Well, again, <laughs> if you don't have sensible shoes, you will have to choose your... Uh, you can choose Cash carefully. Wisely, yeah. For sure. So, yeah, the equipment you need is something with a GPS locating device and a pen or a pencil, and then we're going to plan your search. So, right. uh, so you want to find a geocache. So, again, you... Go to geocaching.com. That's the largest site that there is. There are some other ones, but this one is really the one we've always used. And, and in the beginning, it was definitely the easiest to use. Um, and what you do is you search. So if you're on the computer, you can put in a city, a state, uh, a, a neighborhood, a, a coordinates. Uh, if you have your location activated on your computer, you can ask mm -hmm. it. You know, it knows where you are, and it'll suggest things for you. Um, but you can plan in advance. So when we went to Europe last summer, uh, we put in Amsterdam and Paris, and we scoped it out in advance and had some idea of where the geocaches might be. So you can do it however, however you wish. So yeah. you, you narrow down an area that you're going to, uh, that you're going to look at. Geocaching.com is free. It has a premium membership, which we have done. But in the beginning, we did the premium membership, which was, uh, I mean, a, a whopping $30 yeah. for the year, uh, which, again, is still money. But we did it in the beginning because we were using that GPS device, and that premium membership would enable you to download the, GPS, uh, the uh, coordinates to that device. Now... It, it really, it's unnecessary. The only thing they make you, they try to get people to do the premium uh, membership now because some geocaches are labeled premium only and are only available to premium subscribers. But with more than 3 million geocaches, I'd say a fraction of them are premium only. So right. there are plenty for someone. So you really do not need the premium membership at all. Yeah, but yeah. if you decide that this is really something you like, you'll find... You know, if those features uh, will sort of help you enjoy the uh, the activity more, then then go ahead and invest. Yeah, but for now, free. So geocaching.com would be the first way. You create a profile. Uh, we have just a family name, Desperance, and that's how we sign all of our things. But we do it together. Other families, everyone in the family has a name. 
and each one signs it separately, maybe when people mm -hmm. are doing a lot of geocaching separately. Uh, I'm, we're probably guessing that our teenagers aren't going to be geocaching on their own. <laughs> they geocached with us, but I'm not sure they're going to be geocaching on their own. But I suppose as your children leave the nest, then they get their own geocaching name. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, so choose wisely. Choose yeah, your name wisely. Yeah. Think about that. Uh, so. All right. All right. Then the next thing, so you get a list of results. So if we do a list just for Vestal, New York, which is the area that we live in near, near Binghamton, where, if people are watching mm -hmm. from afar, um, 408 results pop up within a 10 mile radius. Uh, I think of and, our th and this was actually from a couple. Of this slides from a couple of years ago, so I'm sure there's even more now. Uh, actually, not. I oh, really? I looked. No, no. about the same. Okay, it's about the same. Right. So, so you can get it on a list form, and then if you want to go to the next slide, okay. you can also get it as a map form. So, this is actually a current map, um, and it's. I, I think it's a super cool picture because look at the smiley face down in the lower left hand corner. So people intentionally place these caches, the things to find, and they do do that. They make designs, and so clearly someone put all those geocaches there so that when you looked at the map, it would show up like a smiley face. And the different colors are actually different kinds of geocaches. So um, that those blue eyes are different kinds of of geocaches, and right. we can pull up that site later and, and go right. over that. So this is what it looks like on the computer, but you could also do the very same thing on your phone, and you'd open up your phone, and your phone would show you uh, a similar map, So and, and we'll show a phone thing too. No, that's it. Right, so yeah, when you actually uh, you select click on one a, of them, right, so, yeah, you'll get the details of that cache, which includes a description. And there's actually a lot of caches that have these really great stories as to why it was placed there, either talking about the history, maybe some geological info, uh, but also they'll give you information on sort of the difficulty. Uh, like up here, in, uh, you'll see uh, the two star, or, or one and a half stars of difficulty and, and one and a half stars of, of terrain. So that, that'll be pretty easy yes. to get to. So it's a combo, and actually I think the description is more on the next slide, but All on right. this slide, so. That is the one of the first things that you're going to look for. So when you click on it, you're going to first see difficulty, terrain, and size. Now, again, if you're in a hurry uh, and you have people with you that are not going to be patient, then you're not going to choose something that has a high degree of difficulty because the de degree of difficulty usually does uh, equal the amount of time that you're going to spend to try to find it. Uh, also, the size. So the smaller it is, sometimes the harder it is to find. The terrain, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, Drew said wear sensible shoes. Yeah. If you have high-heeled shoes on uh, or you have somebody who is unable to walk very easily, you're not going to choose anything other than a one-star terrain. So usually a one-star terrain means that you are on a solid surface like a parking lot or a sidewalk. And then as you go up in stars, you are farther away from a 100% a accessible location or, or path that you're on. Um, so you're gonna initially usually do that. Right. Um, then you wanna go to the next slide. I was gonna say, you, you, the other thing you wanna do is look at the log. Yeah, it's gonna come oh, up. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the next thing is the description. So there is, uh, again, how, how it ended up getting there, why the person thought to put it there, what the history of the place is, what they were, um, what memory they were invoking when they put this here, what they hope the visitor gets out of it. So there'll be, or, or and sometimes there's almost nothing, but sometimes there's a very lengthy thing. And again, if you're in a hurry, you just cut to the chase, you go to the bottom and you see what it says about exactly kind of what the details of, of this are. So. Here's the description for a geocache that is not currently uh, enabled at Copernic, but right. this was this was the yeah the we, we did we do it we did have a uh, a cache here, but uh, as we were working on our Copernic Science Park, the cache was sort of placed where the park was was going to be put. So uh, we uh, we had that that cache decommissioned, and it will eventually uh, return in a slightly different form, but uh, it will be back once we've uh, completed the construction on the science park. 
So again, some visitor to Bestville, New York might be looking to log a few caches and might end up discovering the Copernic Observatory because they were in this area and found this cache at this, at this, at this location. Um, on the bottom there, you see additional hints. So if you want to put something in there as a hint, it encrypts it so that you don't accidentally see it. You have to kind of click on it to say decrypt it. And then if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, it, oh, it, it's sort of a spoiler alert, you know. It, yes. uh, but sometimes yes. some hints aren't really that particularly helpful. <laughs> no. So then the, la the final thing you want to do is check the log, and that's what Drew said before. So the log is the recording of visitors to this geocache, to this uh, cache. And it's going to tell you whether it has been found. That, so when a person logs an entry, we say whether they found it or didn't find it. And if there's uh, some need of maintenance. So for example, this one was in need of maintenance. And that alerts the owner to the fact that there needs to be something repaired or, or replaced. Um, found it is when you when someone has found it and then do not did not find tells you that maybe it has been washed away or it has been damaged in some way or stolen so again you always want to look at the activity log before you go try to find something because it's really a bummer when you go drive out of your way or spend some time and energy trying to find a geocache that is not actually there but also, it, just because somebody didn't find it doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, there have been times when... Correct, <laughs> right? So, so again, it, it, we have found ones that we someone put that they did not find. So um, you want to tell the story? Or? Yeah, so the other day I was um, at, at, a a bank. At, a, at a bank. And I saw some people walking around with their cell phones in an area that people normally wouldn't be walking around. And they were like going down the hill and looking around and, and I said, you know, I'll bet you there's a geocache here. So I brought it, you know, I'm standing in, I'm in, the, in my car waiting in line to go, you know, to, to the drive up and I bring up the app and sure, of course, there's, a, there's a, a geocache right there, but these people are looking all over the place. And so then I went home and uh, I then looked at the log for that cache and they said, did not find. And I'm thinking, that, I'm almost certain, I, well, first of all, I knew who, who put that cash there, uh, and it, it was a, sort of a standard kind of uh, uh, cash common placement. Common location. Common yeah. location. And so uh, Leanne and I, later that evening, went down, and sure enough, we found the cash. So uh, just because it, somebody didn't find it doesn't mean that it's not there. Sometimes it got put in the wrong place, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a bit. So, so checking the log, and again, all of this is... Uh, dependent on how much time and energy you have to be trying to find things. Uh, so if you're really trying to waste an hour, you'll maybe look for something. But if you're trying to just quick log a cache on your way through town, you are not going to want to spend your time on ones that are going to be uh, difficult. To right, find. exactly. All right. All right. So again, we said uh, what we predominantly use is our phone, and we use the geocaching app. I actually have it in my travel folder on my phone. And uh, so that's what it looks like on the phone. You just open it up and it will default to your current location and it will show you what is around in your current location. So on this picture here, so the green uh, little, uh, what looks like a little treasure chest icon, those are traditional caches. That's the, and it, and it says traditional right above right. Copernic. So that's a traditional cache. The ones with the blue um, question, the mark. question mark is a puzzle cache. That's some sort of puzzle that you have to figure out, and then you get the location, uh, the, the coordinates for it. Right. Um, that the right picture is what it what the other part of it looks like on the phone. So again, there's the difficulty, the terrain, the size. Uh, you can click on hint to get the hint, the click on description to get the description, activity, so all easily accessible from that. Um, and then the, the really nice thing about the phone is that button up top there that says log geocache. Uh, so we'll get to that in a minute. And then uh, if you click on activity, now the next slide, then uh, you're going to see this. So again, that's found um, or did not find. So on your map view, a found geocache turns into a smiley face. 
a little yellow smiley face. So if you, like when we, if we look at our at our geocache map, you know we can see all the ones that we that we have got, and then the ones that still look like that little treasure chest means those, those are ones we we've yet to to uh, to connect with. And we confess <coughs> sometimes we don't log did not find. Right. So did not find is a frowny face. Right. right? And. Uh, we tend to not log it when we think it's just our lack of time to look for it. But when we really look for it exhaustively, then we log it. But if we think we should just come back and try again, sometimes we don't log it. So. All right, so now containers. I talked about you know, finding Tupperware in the woods, but it's not just Tupperware. These, yeah, so the, are these are, oh, sorry. <coughs> no, they, these are all different uh, forms of, uh, uh, geocaching containers that are these are actually commercially made geocaching containers uh, again here's the Tupperware one that's sort of a, a, a lock and lock uh, but some people get really clever they make it look like a piece of wood that that you can twist or uh, a part of a pine cone that might maybe is buried um, yeah so you, like you can buy the stones that you keep your key in right. at the front door you can buy all kinds of geocaching containers that look like uh, objects too, right. and then people make their own also. So then there are a bunch of really stinker ones, like this one down here in the in the lower left, uh, is literally not even a, a bar barely a half inch tall and maybe about three eighths of an inch in diameter, and it's got a magnetic base. And they call that a nano. A nano, right? Uh, a nano tube or something. Yeah. So, um, so it's helpful to know that some of the kinds of things that you're going to be looking for. If it's something out in the woods, it tends to be bigger, like an ammo can or yeah, ammo box. Right. And if it's not out in the woods, it tends to be smaller. So we're going to show you some other kind of cause. So they're usually weather resistant, ideally. So something that seals so that the water doesn't get in. We're not getting into placing them. Honestly, Drew and I have never placed one. So people who get into it, once you start collecting them uh, or finding them, you also want to place them. So think you have to think about with the containers having them be, be waterproof. They're supposed to be marked on the outside, clearly identifying them as a geocache so that when someone finds it, they don't just think that it is a piece of garbage and throw it away. So right. that's what the stickers are for. You can just buy stickers and so you can put them on your own geocaches or again, you can- um, Yeah, you can buy the, buy the containers merch. Containers are marked, yeah. yeah. All right, but then people start getting clever creative, yeah. on how they uh, hide their caches. So uh, this w otherwise looks like a, you know, a, a vent, either for a, a fireplace or something, but uh, the, my guess is this is the owner of the house uh, or that building, and they placed it in such a way such that you know, uh, if you just, uh, I'm sure the, the, the case itself is actually magnetically held, and then you just sort of pull on it, it'll just pop right out and there's the cache. Or you can get, again, a real stinker of a, of a cache is it looks like a sort of a rusted bolt, but in actuality, um, it's all hollowed on the inside. And this, this uh, thing here, that is actually the log that you'll sign and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And I really like the, again, the, uh, the painted rust. They really, uh, really went out of their way to make it uh, uh, a very Realistic, stealthy yes, cache. Yes. Uh, sometimes you make it look like it's a part of an electrical box, but again, it just with the right with the right magnet, you know, it'll just, you know, never have we ever had to sit there and really pry something out. Yeah, so that uh, we've seen that on the back of a sign uh, and on the side of a, a you know another metal thing like that. So there's magnet inside of that, and it's just a, stri a sheet of paper inside of it, nothing else. So that all the two that we just showed, not the first one, but the previous, the second two, that's why you need to have your own pen or pencil because there is no room for a pen or pencil in this one or in that little bolt uh, container. So we. Yeah, this is sort of a, uh, for me, one of the things I, I find really enjoyable about geocaching is the, the cleverness that some people go to, 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 uh, camouflage the cache so that it looks like something that should be there, but it really shouldn't be there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so it, you start scratching your head as to, you know, well, you know, it's supposed to be in this area, but what is it? You know, and uh, so, so sometimes we- so You're trying to figure out yeah. something that seems like it doesn't belong. All right, let's go on. All right. 
So what's in a cash? Um, a cash can come in many forms, but usually the first thing that is in there, and sometimes the only thing that's in there, is a log book or a logged strip of paper or piece of paper. Uh, you can tell how popular the cash is sort of by the size of the log that's in it. Sometimes it's few and far between that people sign. Um, in its simplest form, it can just be a log book. Larger things, larger caches often have trinkets to trade in them, so some items in it. That's from that original start, too, so uh, leave something, take something. We call it geo crap <laughs> at our house. Uh, we sort of have a container of little things, although when our kids were younger, they wanted to take things out of the cache, like, uh, you know, it would be a tattoo from a Cracker Jack. Or a, hand, a, a hand, hand band. Yeah, one of those silly bands yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. So we had a group of things that they could put something in to replace what they were taking out. So those are sort of trinkets to trade. Um, and then sometimes there's some kind of thing that says this is a geocache or, uh, you know, leave it where you found it or um, sometimes contact information for the cache owner, although that's less likely now that things are all done electronically. Um, and, and again, if you take something, then you should leave something. And, and often the sheet or the logbook are inside of a plastic bag, which you saw in the earlier one, to keep things dry for sure. And then the other thing that can be in caches are travel bugs. Mm -hmm. And travel bugs, uh, we'll talk about in a minute. So. So once you have found the cache, then you need to log it. So you log it in two ways. You log it by writing your name on the piece of paper that's in it. If you're like us and you occasionally forget your pen, then you don't log it and you mm -hmm. sometimes take a picture on your, on your phone of it. It's really the honor system though. Nobody goes to it and goes to see that you actually logged it uh, on their piece of paper. It almost does them a favor if you don't always log it because they have to replace the log less often. Um, but that's the, that's the traditional protocol is that you sign in the log. And, and then you log it also on the electronic platform. So when we used to do it with the device, we'd have to kind of remember them at the end of the trip and then log them in on the phone, we just log as we go. So if there is a full log, then you're gonna wanna sort of note that when, when you log it or if the, the paper is wet or something. Yeah, sometimes like also, if, if it looks like you get near the end of the log, there's only maybe you know, space for three or four more people to, to sign in, uh, so there's a way to actually uh, send a note to the owner yep. saying, you know, ne log needs to be changed soon. Okay, so. got it. Uh, so then once you've logged it, and you've you know, signed that sheet, and you, uh, you, then you put everything back together. The, the one that Drew showed with the bolts, or mm -hmm. whatever you call that, so you'd probably spend longer rolling that little piece of paper up and putting it back in there than you did to find the thing, maybe even, because some of them are pretty tricky to put yeah. back together. And then once you've logged it, and you want to put the container back exactly where you found it. So when, when, you, think you, when you think you found it, you know, and you move it, make just make a note of how it was positioned, what was around it. Sometimes there may be some sticks or stuff, that, like in this case, and they might be around there. So you want to uh, you know, try to return it back to the, the same space you know, uh, yeah, exactly that, you, that you put it. Yeah, found it. Okay, then um, travel bugs. So travel bugs are, they're not bugs, but they're, they have a little emblem that looks like a bug. Actually, if you can highlight that. Yeah, um, down, down in this area. Yeah. Uh, so, so travel bugs are UPC coded um, dog tag like mm -hmm. things that, and the co the code is uh, so you you buy the code uh, or you buy the dog, the dog tag, tag kind with of a thing. unique code on it. Yeah, yeah, and that people send on trips or on missions. So you take an item and you put that code on it, and then the goal is for people to pick up that item out of one cash and to move it along according to whatever the owner wants it to be to the next location. Um, so if you can go, so uh, you track this, so you register it each time that you move the coin or the, or the item, 
and that was a BMW 900,000 mile coin or yeah, something right. that from someone had had. Yeah. Oh, yeah, from motorcycle. So every time you move it, you log it in the geocaching.com app, and then you can actually track this travel bug and see where it went in, in the so country. So this, this particular uh, travel bug, we actually, I think we found somewhere near uh, Ithaca, and then we ended up dropping it off up in upstate New York. Uh, then eventually somebody else you know, found it, took it elsewhere, and it en eventually actually ended up on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, if you go to the next slide, so we had another geocache that we picked up somewhere, which was a, a John Deere tractor, and this was part of a series of travel bugs that this person had placed, all in a, in a testament to farms across U America. So one of the problems with picking up a travel bug is that you have to deposit it again. That's yeah. the goal, is not to keep it at your house forever. So we kept meaning to try to, try to get rid of it. And it's hard to do sometimes because they're big, and a lot of the caches that you find are not big enough to accommodate the travel bug that you have, depending on how big the travel bug is. So that picture there on the left is, I think, uh, I don't know, Drew's hand maybe with the travel bug in it. And on the right, that's actually my dad. And it was, it was uh, we got the travel bug, I think, in like June or something, at July mm -hmm. in Vermont on vacation. Right. And... It, my dad is looking at it actually in November in Virginia. My dad grew up on a farm, on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, and I thought he would get a kick out of seeing this John Deere tractor because we had a, a John Deere on, our, on the farm. And, but we didn't have any place to put it, so we ended up the next summer putting it in another geocache uh, that we dropped it off in, I think. Uh, or is this where we got? Yeah. No, no, this is where we dropped it off, yeah. yeah. So you see the geocache, and we were supposed to, again, it was supposed to be, oh, and this was an Amish farm, and we mm -hmm. had seen an Amish farmer driving down the thing, and then this was actually a crazy geocache. This is a birdhouse, and you're going to see that Groundspeak logo there. I, I don't right. think I realized that at the time. Oh, that yeah. That was yeah. the Groundspeak logo, because we didn't really know that. And this had an electromagnet that you had to engage in order to be able to open the birdhouse. So you had to twist something and then that right. engaged the electromagnet and then it opened. So anyway, we did drop off the, um, we dropped off the John Deere tractor. At another farm. So yeah. we're pretty reluctant to pick up travel bugs because we feel really guilty when we have them for too long, except Drew looked up a couple earlier today when we were prepping for this and people had them for a really, really, really long time. So we don't feel quite so bad, but. But that's the uh, again, once you get into this and you, 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 you're you going to plan the trip, so just you know, take the bug and take it somewhere else and drop it off. Well, and what will happen is if you're, let's say you're on vacation or you're going to do a little geocaching trip, what you might do is you might scan a couple things that are in your area and you see that one has a travel bug and mm -hmm. that it was just placed there and so you know it's probably still there. And you may choose one just based on the fact that it has a travel bug. So, All right, all right there are a few rules and... These rules really pertain to, all these rules pertain to placing caches, which it may take you a while to do. So you can't put any caches on land maintained by the U.S. National Park Service or the Fish and Wildlife Service. You can't bury them. So that is actually a, a myth that, you, that, you bear, that they're buried. They, they can't be buried. They can't be placed on archaeological or protected historical sites. Right. Um, they can't be close to active railroad tracks. They have to be at least 150 feet away. They can't be on military installations. They can't be near or under highway bridges, dams, government buildings, or airports. So nobody wants anyone to see someone thinking that someone is going to do damage to any of these kinds of sensitive areas. So that's going to be the rationale behind not doing it near a dam or near a bridge or, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, not on school property without permission. No vacation caches. That means no cache that you're putting somewhere that you're not anywhere near so that if it needs maintenance that it can't be done. You're supposed so to put them where near where you live. So think of them as a pet. You know, you got to take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not quite so often as a pet, but uh, no cache closer than a tenth of a mile to an existing cache. So that smiley face thing, they must have like mapped it out to be exactly, I don't know, a tenth of a mile it mm. looks like or... 
Um, and then if it's on someone else's land, you have to have permission from the landowner. So usually people sort of place them on their own property, but if it is someone else's property, you have to get permission for it. So. Okay, who enforces the rules? Well, actually, geocaching.com does. They control the listing of geocaches. They have volunteer reviewers that look at all the entries. They don't actually go to them, but they read all the reviews. And when people say, yeah, this isn't here or what there's problems with it, then they um, investigate those. So they're the ones who enforce the rules. Now, there aren't really many rules for you doing it. There is one rule. You are supposed to be stealthy. You are supposed to try to keep it hidden. A person who is not geocaching, who is around you, is called a muggle. Mm. Many Harry Potter fans know what a muggle is. And you're gonna Harry you'll see that in the log. Uh, people will say, you know, uh, be careful, be stealthy, you know, uh, high muggle area. Yeah, so That's you have to be careful. That. You have to kind of pretend that you're doing something and you're stretching your hand and you're reaching behind <laughs> or you're like, oops, I dropped something and you're looking underneath the bench or whatever. So, um, so you have to be careful. So that's really one of the other rules. And then we already said the other one, put it back where you found it um, and report something if there's a problem. That's really pretty much about it for the geocaching right. and to respect whatever rules are, uh, are around. But if someone put it somewhere, then that means usually that it meets the rules. So you'll find them on the edge of cemeteries, but you usually won't find them in the cemetery, as an example. Yeah, I think that's sort of what got our, our, our daughters initially interested in it because they were big Harry Potter fans. And, uh, and people, you know, if you're part of a group that is not a muggle, you know, so you're a wizard, obviously, then yeah, that sort of, uh, that was yeah. cool. So. Okay. All right, why do it? Well, there's really a... a a bunch of different reasons, and people do it for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, I mean, for me, it's just looking at interesting places. Uh, we've gone to some just outstanding uh, places, met some really, really nice people, and uh, bottom line, you get to learn things. I mean, that's sort of what Copernic's all about, is being a lifelong learner, and I think this sort of uh, is just another uh, avenue to, uh, to do that. Uh, Plus, the puzzles really give you an opportunity to exercise your brain. Again, there have been some real head scratchers yep. um, that have really, wa I say wasted, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out. And then when you finally do figure it out, it's like uh, um, really, really rewarding. And uh, So we'll show you a couple of our favorites. Yeah. Uh, so one, we were driving across from New York State to Vermont. Vermont. And we saw that there was a geocache at a location that said that it was the last working drawbridge in Vermont. And so we actually went over the road. We went through the, the islands uh, up um, near Plattsburgh yeah, and right. then down. And we waited and we got there when the bridge was being operated actually. And we ended up striking a, a conversation with the drawbridge attendant who was there. Mm. And you see that red brick uh, little tower there, uh, the drawbridge operator told us that fairly recently she had been um, working a shift and the drawbridge got stuck going um, down. Right, this is where she had to go in to, to operate the drawbridge. And, and when it was moving, it got stuck and it was stuck in the position that uh, it was like halfway down and it went right across the door into that building yeah. so she could not get out and there's no bathroom in there. Mm -hmm. So she, it was a, an, an amusing story and uh, we had a, a very interesting time talking to that woman. Uh, the cash wasn't actually on the bridge, it was near it, yeah. but we ended up you know, having a discussion with the, with the woman in the front. And, and we had no idea that that was the last covered bridge yeah. and um, you know that they were stopping them. So. Um, so this is actually the entrance to a ferry when we were in Holland last summer with, uh, with friends who took us on a ferry trip to an island in the middle of one of the uh, large lakes there in Holland. And we went, to, uh, you can go to, we went out to the lake, I mean to the island, and mm -hmm. it's a, uh, it's a, has some farmland out there and a little old museum and a cafe, and sure enough it had uh, two geocaches out there. So mm -hmm. that is our friend from Holland who uh, found was was excited to find a, a geocache that and that's like a little plastic kind of test tube sort yeah, of yeah, um, right. container. So this is an example of a missed opportunity and and also 
to point out that there are different kinds of caches. So initially it just started, they were, they were called the, this GPS dash and then it ended up becoming called geocache. Um, this, there are earth caches and those are caches where you go to a particular coordinate and then you see a geologic formation and it will ask you questions and you, in order to log the cache, need to email the answers to the, the person. There's no, there's no physical cache for you to find, but there are questions about the area that you may have to you know, look at a particular direction and, and you know, identify something that you see there. So this was actually a peak in New Hampshire that we were hiking with a group of friends. It was quite the hike and a whole day adventure. And only after we got back down did we realize that there had been a geocache right where we were in standing. Uh, but we did not look at it. And it was an earth cache, so we would have had to answer the questions to the thing. So, and uh, it, we weren't going to go we back were not the going next back. day. No. So, um, so <laughs> earth caches and whatever. Yeah. Um, this was on a trip to New Smyrna Beach, Florida, which is near Daytona. We scratched our heads and scratched our heads, looking and looking and looking. This cache is no longer there. That's what we're uh, sh showing you. Um, and it, the, the description was all about going to... Watch, watching launches. Watching launches with his grandfather right. or something like that. And he placed this series of caches there to be on the beach. And um, here's where the, the... So this was on the back of a sign. And it was an oddly placed piece of PVC pipe, and then watch where the camera. So yeah, so watch closely on the, the, on the picture. On the picture on the right. So she reached in, our daughter reached in, pulled down a rubber band, and it shot out a. Um, I'll, I'll show you that again. Oops, actually, hold on. So that's one of the coolest caches we've seen. Yeah, so. we really like that. All right. Oh, one more time, just in case you missed it. <laughs> so there are other kinds of things. This is called Cido, cash in, trash out. So this was an event actually in um, Milwaukee. So uh, cashers will pick up and tote out a bag or two worth of trash they find along the way. So this is actually a, an organized event in Milwaukee, but people will just sort of always do it and carry a bag with them. Um, there are multi-step caches where you have to do like three in a row and then you finally get to some bigger cache at the end. Um, there are other virtual caches besides the earth caches. Uh, there, this um, company that created this is always looking for new projects. So in fact, if you are really interested, here's their little promotional ad. Maybe a career there interests you. And that's what started the biggest thing you've probably never heard of. In May of 2000, the US military finally learned how to share and flipped a switch that made civilian GPS devices just as accurate as theirs. Within a day, the very first geocache was hidden and the coordinates were posted on the internet. A few months later, these guys started Groundspeak to manage geocaching.com, and people loved it. How much did they love it? How about there are more than 2 million geocaches in over 185 countries, and more than 6 million geocachers worldwide? But we didn't stop with just geocaching. <laughs> oh no. We've continued to dominate the location-based adventure by filing patents, winning awards, and innovating new projects like trackables, waymarking, where I go, and Saito. That leads us to where we are today. We have a dedicated, no, obsessed worldwide community, a global network of adventures, and plenty of room to grow. In fact, we've only scratched the surface of our potential. We won't stop until there's an adventure in every location. And we've got room for you. You in? So that was obviously a couple years ago, and I'm not sure if they're still uh, looking for people, but it looks like a kind of fun place to work. So, all right, that's it for us. That's uh, Jason. All right, so uh, hello, okay. Carter family. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, if there, if there are any questions, uh, be happy to uh, uh, 
answer them now. Um, I think we are currently we've got something like about 177, 178 caches that we've that we've logged, and um, uh, we um, uh, again, it, it, especially where uh, when you start taking long trips and you really need to take uh, take some time to uh, you know to get up, stretch your legs. Also, you you also find that uh, a lot of times uh, you'll there'll be sort of standard places where caches are, are located, like they'll use those magnetic key holders. Uh, sometimes, actually, in parking lots, they uh, the, for the for the the light the, 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 the light stand, you know, for the parking lot, there's actually a skirt that's at the at the base that interfaces with the the concrete pad, and that skirt will actually lift up, and there'll be ca caches there. Back so, and for a family which we've often done it as a family, uh, what we do is we have a rule that we, no one says anything. So all of us circle the area, we try to look, we wait until everyone who wants to has had a chance to try to find where it is, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then we announce it. So it, either someone gives up and says, I don't wanna, you know, I give up or whatever, and, and we, we will say, we will, uh, we'll eye it or spot it, and then we will walk far away from it, and then we will sort of say, I know where it is. Right. And um, so that's how we do it as a family, and even when we have a large group, sometimes of eight or ten people, that's how we manage doing that. Everyone who wants to participate waits mm -hmm. until you, you see it. Because once you see the container, you sort of know right. what it is, and you, you, you don't need to open it yet until you're ready to sign the log. Yeah, um, uh, again, you know, how people have been so clever in, in hiding some of them. There, at one point, there was like a piece of of uh, tree moss, uh, you know, that or, or uh, a fungi kind of thing that, that was on the side of a of a tree, and I just sort of touched it and it swung. <laughs> so somebody went to the point of, of of slicing it off, hollowing it out to put the log inside, and then putting a little nail in there and then putting it right back so that it looked like it belonged right yeah. there. So, uh, so somebody commented on physical distancing. So yes, so we've been doing some geocaching, uh, uh, which again, you can do because it's sort of solitary. I would just recommend like with anything, wash your hands. Uh, I, I mean, most geocaches are not found 10 times a day. They are found once a week or you know, even less frequent than that. Sometimes a popular geocache might be found once a day. Uh, but I would say long enough, so I'm actually a physician, I, I would say long enough that the risk of transmission of germs is probably small, depending on the container, but all you really need to do is just make sure that you wash your hands after touching it. You won't be standing around anyone else because that's the whole point. If you see someone that you think is also looking for the geocache, protocol is not you don't say anything you actually sort of walk away and you wait until you can come back when there's no one there so it's really a solitary uh, solitary effort um, is it better to use a geocaching app or a GPS app is any particular out there so geocaching.com is really the thing that we have used exclusively yeah. it's super easy to use very satisfying easy to log lots of comments and lots of activities, so it's the best way we found to know whether an, a, a geocache is gonna be there or not. Again, you could do the GPS app, but you have to find a listing of the geocaches, so the, geo, the GPS app would help you once you got the location. Um, if, you, if you didn't want to uh, use data and you just could use your phone with the, geo, the GPS app, which again, satellite doesn't require mm. cellular, right. and satellite is much more ubiquitous than cellular is cellular coverage is. Yeah, it, you know, especially I think as you as you go further along, you may end up uh, having a second, you know, a second device. One of the things that you'll find is that you know, as you're looking around, you know, it'll say you are within uh, eight feet, and then you look down again, you're within 23 feet, and it's pointing you in a different direction. So it's it's. It's trying to figure out about where you are, and uh, so it keeps moving around. <laughs> so uh, again, sometimes having two or three different uh, uh, devices will will help you, uh, you know, help you hone in on on where, on where that uh, where that is. Uh, again, ninety nine percent of the of the ones that we do are, at this point are are with our phone, and um, uh, and that and that's really worked quite nicely for us. Um, bring a, bring an extra battery, <laughs> as well. You know, so if you're gonna start doing this uh, throughout the day, 
uh, have a have a cell phone, you know, you know backup battery for you with you. Um, so unless there's any other questions, I guess the other thing I'll do is I'll just sort of touch briefly. I'm going to minimize uh, this and uh, I'm going to bring up uh, Stellarium again and just sort of let you know what's going on. Um, I'm going to go to uh, right now and um, sort of turn on. So right now we're just uh, just around uh, uh, sunset. But uh, tonight, there's a couple of couple of things that, that uh, are going to be visible to us. And uh, hold on, am I, am I still fast forwarding? I am. Okay, let's go to right now. So um, uh, with our planetarium software here, we can um, go. We're going to increase to say, let's go to 9:30 tonight. Uh, you'll see that in the south uh, east, there's Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Jupiter will be the the bright the bright light in the sky, and Saturn uh, to, to, uh, to the left and a little lower. Uh, again, if we uh, highlight uh, Jupiter and uh, center it, scroll in, and if you've got either a, a, a telescope or even some decent set of binoculars, you might well see the four Galilean moons. Uh, at 9.30, that's, this is the way they'll be set up. Uh, Callisto uh, over here, uh, uh, Io, Ganymede, and Europa will be uh, to the other side. And then uh, we back off a little bit. Actually, here, we're going to turn off some of the, uh, the cartoons because they don't actually exist in the sky. Uh, then we can close in here on Saturn and um, zoom right in, and there's Saturn. Uh, but Saturn is twice as far away from uh, us as Jupiter is, so uh, a little harder to see. Uh, but the other thing, that there's a couple other things that are going on tonight. Uh, I'm going to back up here to um, about uh, 9.16. And uh, actually, we're going to look to the north. And a lot of people have been calling and asking about Comet Neowise. And so right now, uh, we're at 9.30. Well, let's, let's scroll over here to 9.30. Uh, it'll be at... Uh, in the northwest, the, uh, if you have a compass, it'll be at an azimuth of about 320 degrees and an elevation of about 18. Now at 930, it's still still going to be difficult to see naked eye. You might see it with a good set of binoculars or a modest uh, telescope. Um, but um, one of the things I was also going to mention to you, though, is at 914, if we uh, back up here and we uh, go over to the south, you see this other dot here, that's the ISS. So uh, in about 35 minutes, if you've got a good southwest horizon, uh, you'll see the ISS pop up. And as time goes on, you'll see it go further and further high, uh, higher in, in the sky. And right now it's actually sort of you know, running sort of real time. Uh, we'll continue to go uh, over here in the, uh, in the US. It's at, uh, it would just about go over, overhead. It's a, um, and then uh, as we continue on down, it'll finally set around, uh, you know, 921, 922 uh, or so. So then let's go to 1030. And uh, Comet Neowise, again, you're going to need to be in a location that has got a good northwest uh, horizon. We do not have one here at Copernic. <laughs> uh, we have a tree line horizon that cut, uh, clips us out about uh, 12, 15 degrees. So um, coming up to Copernic tonight is not going to be helpful uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, but Comet Neowise will be um, uh, at, uh, at 1030, will be at, at uh, 200 and, uh, 327 degrees of azimuth and about 11 degrees of elevation. Uh, now what's also going to be interesting is if we open this up a little bit, and I'm going to scroll a little bit further time-wise. You're going to see a little dot come down. Uh, there it is. That's the ISS. The ISS will have another pass at uh, 1050. Uh, so let me back up a little bit, show you where that's going to come out of. The ISS will, about 1051, 1052, it'll come out of the west. It reaches a maximum elevation of about. Uh, uh, 
I think uh, 30 degrees or something like that, and then uh, will eventually set into the northeast like that. Uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, yeah, the, you asked about the night sky live. Yeah, that is a new feature on Heavens Above, and uh, maybe we can go to that because uh, that's a, a great app for, uh, to look at. Heavens Above is um, uh, something we use a lot here. Uh, it's, it's heavens-above.com. And uh, if one of our other people are, are watching, if you want to put that in the chat so that people can, uh, can find that. Um, I have a, a login that I use. So, it no, so I put in my, it puts in my longitudinal latitude. So here in the southern tier, you can just put 42 degrees of, of northern latitude and 76 west uh, longitude, and that will be close enough. And this live, live view sky that was uh, commented is that tells you what's what's up there right now. What's literally what's what's coming by. So it's a Starlink uh, satellite here and here and here. A uh, couple of Cosmos uh, uh, satellites, and here's Comet Neowise. So that's sort of a neat uh, a neat thing. Uh, the ISS information is also right here. You uh, you can click on ISS. And it'll tell you all of the uh, passes that are visible. You could, you could do all of the passes, that, whether they're visible or not. So again, if we look at the one that, that starts at 914, you'll see that it comes out of the you know, south, uh, southwest. It gives you the time. And it's literally going to be almost directly overhead. It's like an 85 degree uh, elevation and then set at uh, 923. Um, it's also sort of neat. You can find out. Uh, uh, where the Starlink uh, satellite passes uh, are. So we can go and take a look at that. There's a Starlink, you know, one of the Starlink uh, satellites that will be coming th through the north there. Um, we can also do some other neat little things, like the uh, uh, thing I like doing is looking at the height of the ISS. ISS, again, is this huge space station, and you can see it's... It's varying between 414 uh, degrees, uh, I mean, uh, kilometers. Uh, then over time, after about a month and a half, then they boosted up a couple of kilometers. Uh, they then dropped it back down for some reason. And you can see, actually, that it's, it's got this sort of fairly consistent uh, degradation. So they have to constantly be booting it up, uh, boosting it up, you know, every six weeks or so just to, you know, keep it up um, from falling into the earth. But also sometimes they'll use it for... Uh, 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 avoid to, to avoid collisions. Um, so sometimes they'll do that. So obviously they, they boost it up here and then they boost it back down again. So um, heavens above is a great uh, uh, a, a great a great uh, website to check out. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things we won't spend a whole lot more more time on this. But uh. so anyway, uh, tonight go find yourself uh, a good northern uh, northwestern uh, horizon and see if you can catch the comet. Um, it's going to, it's sort of uh, past its peak in, in brightness. It's going to slowly getting dimmer and dimmer. So the sooner you, you catch it, the better off you'll be. Uh, again, the ISS will be passing by. Uh, I just read this afternoon that uh, our Southern Tier native, uh, Doug uh, Hurley, is scheduled to come back on August 1st. So he's only got a couple more weeks left uh, before, um, uh, before he before he and Bob Benkin uh, uh, return and splash down uh, in the Atlantic, there was a question: Do you connect the refractor? Uh, we are. Here's another thing we're going to try to do. Um, we are going to try to do some live streaming of some um, of viewing through the telescopes uh, tonight. Uh, Jeremy will start. A, it'll be a separate live stream. So uh, if you're subscribed, um, it'll, it should you should get an email about that, or otherwise just keep. Uh, Refreshing the YouTube, uh, the Copernic, uh, the Copernic channel, and we'll let you know when uh, we're going live again. But uh, so we're gonna. This is our sort of maiden voyage. We're trying to do some, some actual live observing uh, via live stream. So um, we'll um, wish us luck on that, and uh, we'll we'll uh, hopefully we'll we'll uh, be successful at it, and we can do uh, do more of that as uh, as the skies and and uh, and times permit. So. Well, thank you again for, uh, for coming. Again, um, uh, this has been a tough time for uh, all of us, and especially for nonprofits. Uh, again, if you look down in the description, there's an opportunity to, uh, 
uh, to donate. So if you're in a position to uh, to do so, uh, it ends up uh, doing a donation through PayPal, and um, it's in lieu of you know you having had had to have come up here to pay uh, pay your regular admission. So uh, look forward to uh, seeing you hopefully next week. Uh, Tish Brizzy will be talking again about the next Mars, uh, the Mars uh, rover uh, Perseverance that's supposed to be launching at the end of June, the beginning of August. And it's got to do that within those three week period of time. Otherwise we have to wait another, I think it's 26 months before uh, Mars gets close enough for us to launch again. So uh, let's hope that uh, that works for us. Have a great evening. Please stay safe, wear your mask. It's only an inconvenience. And uh, let's squash this uh, COVID thing so that we can all get back together sooner than later. Thanks again. And uh, it's great to, to have you with us. So long.